Okay, welcome everyone. We're going to get started with a little bit of housekeeping while we wait for some additional attendees to get signed into the session. So again, welcome uh, to this special session on study skills provided to you by Tutor.com, a service of the Princeton Review. We are going to start, um, as I said, with some housekeeping. So everyone is in listen only mode for the session but you will have the opportunity to ask us questions throughout the session and then the second half of the session will be a live q a where our presenter amy will actually take some of your questions so the best way for you to communicate with us is going to be through the question box on your control panel you can also submit questions if you're having any issues or uh, technical challenges with your audio for example throughout the session you can put those questions in there my name is Lauren and I will be helping to answer some of those and help with troubleshooting as well as Marcus who is one of our team members who's on the call to help with that. So again, use the question box throughout and we will uh, do a live Q&A towards the end for some of your questions around the content. Um, just to do a quick sound check here, make sure everybody's ready to get started. There's a little raise your hand tool on the control panel. I'd like to see if you guys can go ahead and raise your hands. Bunch of hands going up, awesome. Great, so I'm gonna put your hands down. Thank you for participating and we're gonna get into the session. So again, welcome everyone to our special session today on study skills. This is a session brought to you by tutor.com, a service of the Princeton Review, and is a part of our ongoing student success webinar series. We first hosted these sessions over the summer and decided to do them again this fall because the content seemed to be of such great interest to students uh, out there who are facing new challenges in this academic year. Obviously, I don't have to tell all of you, it is a unique year in terms of how school and education is being delivered. And so the needs of students are even greater than normal, especially for online resources. Tutor.com, we, we provide timely, on-demand online tutoring help day in, day out, that's what we do. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could support students in other ways, which is why we're putting on this webinar series. Important note that every session is recorded and posted to our YouTube channel, which we'll be sharing with you towards the end of the session. Additionally, if you attend or have registered for this session, you will get a follow-up email from us. It comes out usually one or two days after the session and you will get a recording and the slide deck as a part of that follow-up email just by having registered for the session. So I wanna head that off because a lot of people ask those questions. Um, we will be issuing forth a recording and posting it to our YouTube. So without further ado, our wonderful presenter of uh, these sessions is Amy Dietzman, who is uh, an expert in all things student success. And as I often tell her, a lot of these topics have actually helped me just in my own career and some of my own life skills. So today's session is really focused on study skills and I'm gonna pass it to uh, my esteemed colleague, Amy, to take us through some content. And then at the end of the session, I'll be back to address questions. So uh, Amy, take it away. Great. Hi, everybody. If you've been to one of my webinars before, welcome back. And if not, um, I am Amy Dietzman. I love talking about student success. I used to have um, I taught a college level student success course. And so I, I kind of consider myself an expert because I taught it, but really I kind of consider myself an expert because I was a working adult student. I earned three degrees, all while working full time. And two of those degrees I earned with two young kids at home. I learned from my own mistakes for sure. And from some interesting observations of my own kids and my own students. And I figured out some cool strategies along the way. So now I'm gonna talk about these with you. So today I'm gonna to share some helpful tips for study sessions. And we're gonna talk very specifically about note-taking and test-taking. I'm also gonna to talk to you about how wellness techniques connect to your studying strategies. So no matter your age, if you're a middle schooler, high schooler, college level student, grad school student, or beyond, you can learn something from these tips. Many come from my own experiences, like I told you, and many are research-based. These tips might seem obvious, 
all of my webinars, it's not like I'm giving you this rocket science kind of stuff, but maybe you haven't heard it all at one time, or maybe you haven't heard it for a while. But either way, these are good reminders, and you should ask yourself, are you doing these things, or could you try doing these things? So let's start with all the things you need to do before you start studying. Before you settle in for a session, designate a study area. Make sure your space has all the supplies you'll need, has good light, and set yourself up with a drink and maybe a snack so you don't have to stop your flow. The key to successful studying is focusing and trying to eliminate distractions and interruptions. And when I say that, I know a lot of you are working from home and you're also having you know, your families there at the same time. And people have asked a few times, like, should I move? Should I use the same space? And if you have you know, the opportunity to move and go to a different spot and have a different study space than maybe where you've been sitting all day long, that would be great. But you may not be fortunate enough to have that opportunity. So if you don't, what you need to do is move all your work stuff out of that space and then go into study mode. So go get yourself a drink and your snack and then start over like, okay, this is a new thing. I'm not working anymore. I'm studying. And you need to get rid of the obvious distractions. Turn off the alerts and emails that you get. Put your phone on silent. Leave it in a different room. Tough to do, but really an important piece because you won't be tempted to look at it if it isn't close. Sit in a place where you won't be distracted by your family, your friends, people yelling, loud music, those kinds of things. Make a plan and set a goal. Have an end goal for the time that you've designated and know exactly what you're going to accomplish. You'll waste time if you have to sit down and then sort through all your assignments and your classwork and then figure out what you need to do. So scheduling out your week ahead of time is a good way to use your study time for studying only and not getting organized. And then Big one, reward yourself when you finish a good study session. It's like holding the carrot for yourself. And for me, knowing the reward ahead of time was a good motivation for me. I liked to think about what I was going to do when I was done. Everything I tell you today and everything I've told you in my last webinars requires discipline. Completing a degree, finishing an AP class, studying for the SAT, whatever it is, it all takes discipline and commitment. You have to commit to yourself that you're going to do it and you're going to be a success. My students always have good intentions. At the beginning of every class, they have to answer this question. What is your strategy for completing your work on time in this class? And they are notorious for saying things like, I'm really going to try to study Monday through Friday and not procrastinate. I really want to have my weekends free. But, you know, I'm working part time right now and I'm on the tennis team and I have an internship and I know I'm going to struggle with this. When I read that, I always think, well, you didn't even start and you already came up with your excuse. You already said, I'm not going to be successful at this. Make your intentions real habits. Remember that it takes 66 days on average to form a new habit. So give yourself time to form a good study routine. Bad habits, they are already there. You've established them and they are easier at first. That's really important. They're not easier forever. They're only easier at first because those new habits, I promise you, those better habits will be way easier on you in the long run. Also, you need to be honest with yourself. This is a tricky one. Think of things like this. Is a coffee shop the best place for you to study or does it distract you? If you curl up in that chair, are you likely to fall asleep? I know I am. What time of day is best for your brain? This is a tricky one because a lot of people have convinced themselves that they're not morning people and that they do better at night, but they don't try mornings to see if that's really true. Do you really perform best when you're under pressure? 
My son is a college student. He always tells me that he does best when he's under pressure. But the fact is, he's never not been under pressure. He's never tried to actually be proactive and study for final exams ahead of the actual day that the final exam is. So he doesn't really know if he's better under pressure. He's never written a paper maybe like a week before it's due. So is he better under pressure? I don't know. He does pretty well under pressure. And how long does it really take you to write a paper? That's a really big one. These are questions based on things I heard my own kids say, like I said, and things that I've heard from my own students. Know how your brain works and how you learn best. If you're not sure, try different strategies to figure it out. Like I said, if you think you're not a morning person, try mornings for a little while and see, because if nights aren't working for you, then maybe mornings will, or vice versa. For example, like I know that I don't study well at night. I know that I don't study well when I'm hungry. I know that I don't study well for more than three hours at a time. I think best when I'm organized, and I am honest with myself about these things. I'm not gonna waste time trying to study right before dinner or late at night. And I'm not gonna study when my house needs to be cleaned because it's gonna distract me. And I'm not going to try to write a paper three hours before it's due. <clears throat> Why you shouldn't procrastinate. Does anyone know, hypothetical question, what is wrong with this presentation? Well, I get these kinds of submissions every term, and it is always the student who turns in their assignment at 11.59 p.m. on the day it's due. So what's wrong with this? Well, I can tell immediately that this student didn't give himself time to actually put together a visually appealing assignment. He threw his thoughts down on a blank PowerPoint and turned it in. These are often the submissions riddled with spelling and grammar errors as well. Procrastinators get lower grades. It is a proven fact. Those who work ahead will take the time to put together something better than a white presentation with black words, and they will probably remember to run a spell check. And in case you wonder what is wrong with this, in case it didn't come to you when I showed it, a PowerPoint presentation is a presentation, so it should always have images and colors. So the damage of all-nighters. I've never been able to pull an all-nighter, but students do it all the time. Studies show that a lack of sleep has effects on your blood sugar, immune function, and metabolism. How does it affect your immune function? Well, it wears you down, it exhausts you, and then you're more susceptible to getting sick. Frequent all-nighters also cause weight gain, and the reason is right there on your screen. When you pull an all-nighter, you are more likely to eat junk food to keep yourself awake and alert. Keep in mind that you should always take tests on a good night's sleep and without an empty stomach. So cramming all night before a test is a bad idea. And some researchers say that it actually takes days to recover from lost sleep. And I've even read studies that say you never recover from lost sleep. So the point is, you're just not doing yourself any favors by pulling an all-nighter. Consistency and routine are best. If you can schedule out your study time at the same time every day, you will get into a routine. Routine is best, but if you can't study at the same time every day, map it out for yourself like this. Spend the extra time it takes on Sunday to look ahead at your week. Your appointments, your classes, your work schedule, because maybe your work schedule changes weekly, your commitments to your friends and your errands, and then schedule your study time in there. And make sure you look ahead at all the due dates that you have that week, and so that way you can work backwards and work ahead. Again, not writing a paper three hours before it's due. But the key is to be consistent. If you say you're going to study, you have to hold yourself to it. And remember to be honest with yourself. If you plan to go out to dinner with friends and then you're going to go home and study, don't schedule your dinner for one hour. Because be honest, you know you're not going to eat and talk to your friends for one hour. And then also make sure you post your schedule every week if it changes and have others hold you accountable. Remember, this is also good if you have younger children, because if you don't hold yourself to your schedule, your children won't know when you're studying, 
when you're not studying, when they can bother you, when they shouldn't bother you. But if you post a schedule and you stick to it, you're helping them too. You're helping them to support you. <clears throat> Many researchers and professors will tell you that cramming is bad. But planned cramming is different. I found times when cramming was just what I needed. So I'm going to tell you the truth. Cramming only works for short-term memory. It works really well for vocabulary tests and for what I call one and dones. What do I mean by a one and done? Well, if you're taking a test and you know for a fact that you're never gonna need to know that information for another class or another test, then it's okay to cram and forget about it. An example of this was I took a history class in college and I was not a history major or political science major. I was just taking that one history class I had to take. I was taking many more other important and difficult classes for my major at the time. And this class was at 7.30 a.m. and it was in person. On test days, I used to get up super early and just cram my notes. And I performed really well in that class because when it was over, it was over. I didn't have to think about it again. But when you shouldn't cram is when you have another test coming up and it builds on the knowledge from this test. So you're not doing yourself any favors if you cram before every test and you still have a final exam that comes up that's cumulative. Or if you need to understand a concept because you're gonna to have to learn something more that builds on it, then cramming's not helpful. And cramming is also bad news for essay questions because cramming is only good for a shallow understanding of information. And essay questions always require a deeper understanding. If you haven't studied thoroughly and deeply, you're going to bomb those essay questions. So if you only cram, you're selling your brain short. It needs time to process. If you can't give it time to process new information, if you tr and you will be not giving it time to process new information if you cram it all in at the last minute. So how do you study the right way when you actually need to really learn something and not just memorize something? First of all, don't multitask. Using your phone, texting, checking social media, replying to emails, or even trying to study while you're working, just like on the side, you know, you're kind of like writing a discussion question answer, but you're also working. It's probably not the most effective. There is much research to prove that those who multitask don't give anything their full attention and therefore give each task just a percentage of what they could give it if they just focused. Multitasking causes trouble organizing your thoughts. And that would be okay if you were working on something that you knew backwards and forwards. But when it comes to learning something brand new, this just doesn't work. It diminishes your ability to filter irrelevant information. And if you're like me, you wanna quickly identify what's irrelevant because it cuts down on the time that you're gonna spend studying. Multitasking also steals your refocusing time. So refocusing time is, means that it takes an average of 14 minutes to refocus completely on a task after you've answered an email or responded to a text. So just think about that. A full 14 minutes that you lose by just looking at a text message and thinking about that for a bit and then going back to your studying. Huge waste of time. Much better to just put the stuff aside and focus fully. Do it right the first time. Lots of students fall into the trap of believing that rereading chapters or rewatching lectures will help them get the information better. It doesn't really work that way. It's better to take the information in, commit it to your mind and understanding by processing and reflecting on it and then reviewing it in a new way. You wanna review it in a new way. So for example, if you watch a lecture or a video, let's say, have your notes ready. Watch a small section, then stop it, jot down what you got from that. If something is confusing, Google it quickly. See if you can find something that you can read or watch that makes more sense to you. Then go back to your lecture or your video and watch again for a few minutes. 
then repeat that same process. So see, it's taking you a little longer to watch the video because you're pausing it often and you're writing things down and looking things up, but you're doing it right the first time. You're not gonna have to go re-watch that later. Same with reading an article. Read it once and stop throughout to talk yourself through what you just read, taking notes as you go. In addition, don't waste time reviewing what you already know. If you make flashcards and you go through them and you know all of them, then don't keep doing it. Take that time instead to review the stuff that you don't know. Our tendency is to review the easy stuff that we already get because it gives us confidence but it really does nothing to help us on a hard test. Similar to what I just explained about doing it right the first time, if you attend a class in person, never sit there and just listen. Very few of us actually retain information just from hearing it, especially if it's a dry or complicated topic. Passive learning is when you just let something come to you. You just sit there and you listen and you hope you're gathering as much information as you need to and yet you'll remember it later magically. But being an active learner means that you're taking the information in, you're actually processing it and you're putting it into your own words. Or maybe you're drawing pictures while you're listening. You're making meaning of it as you're listening at the same time. So, one of the worst things we have to do as students, and I shouldn't say worst, maybe it's just the most boring, uh, is read a textbook or a dry textbook, right? But there is a way to do it. If you're assigned a chapter to read, or maybe two or three chapters, don't just open your book and start reading front to back. What you want to do is preview the chapter first. Flip through it. How long is it? Set your mind to what you're going to accomplish. Look at the headings, sections, pictures, tables, graphs. Help your brain kind of go like, oh, okay, this is what's coming, I'm ready. Then read the introduction to the chapter. We often skip this part, but it actually helps to put context to what's coming. And then flip to the end of the chapter and read the summary. It's probably not all gonna make sense yet because you haven't read the chapter, but it will help you to make connections as you read. It's all part of the processing. And then go back to the beginning of the first section and begin reading. Read in chunks, read a section, then go to your notes and summarize in your own words what you learned. Remember, don't read the whole thing all at once. Your eyes are gonna start to glaze over, your mind's gonna start to wander, and suddenly you'll realize that you just read three pages and you have no idea what you just read. Remember to be an active learner, which means to be an active reader. You're constantly stopping, talking yourself through what you just read, asking yourself questions. So how do you take good notes? I mean, we've talked about taking notes a lot, and a lot of people say, I am a terrible note taker. So first of all, the biggest mistake we wanna avoid is over highlighting. If you're reading a textbook and you can't narrow down what's important to just a phrase or two or a sentence or two on a page, then it's not even worth highlighting. Plus, if you highlight, then every time you wanna study, you're tied to your textbook. A notebook or the notes page on your computer are much easier to open and review at a later date. Also remember that if you're highlighting, you're not forcing yourself to put it into your own words. Remember that part of that processing is making meaning of it and putting it in your own words. And if you're highlighting, you're just saying, hmm, I think that's important. And then will you remember that later? Probably not. Turn the headings into, in the beginning of the chapters, all the little headings that you see, turn those into questions and then answer the questions with your notes below. Now this is harder. This is definitely a harder way of taking notes, but it's really effective because you're actually answering questions so you are for sure getting what you're reading. And always put your notes in your own words. I've said that a few times too. I'm a big bullet list person. So I like outline notes where I just jot down big ideas and concepts in an outline format. Rarely do I write in complete sentences. I'm not a fan of notes that don't come easily and naturally, but that's me. 
you have to think about what works for you. And when you read a textbook, you should always pay special attention to vocabulary words. <clears throat> so research shows we learn more from writing than we do from typing. If you prefer to type, that's okay, start there. See if it works for you. And here's how you'll know. After you take a test, look back at your notes and see if you had any of the pertinent information there. If you didn't, then you know that you had difficulty identifying the important information. But if you had really good typed notes and you just didn't remember when it came to the test, you suddenly forgot everything, then that's when you need to try handwriting your notes next time to see if that works better for you. This is really true for any kind of notes. One thing we never do is look back at them after the test to see if we have good notes. If the test was on totally different information, then you need to try a new strategy. If your notes are really good and you just didn't retain the information, then you may need to consider a different way of organizing your notes. So really the point here is, just like with everything I say, figure out what works for you. Don't stick to the same thing over and over again if you keep bombing tests, right? Don't keep doing it, try something else. And depending on the subject, this step can be very critical. If you draw pictures or maps, you will be more likely to understand the connection between things. Plus, if you're a visual learner, then you'll be more likely to remember that picture when you go take the test. So instead of just listing lipids, carbohydrates, proteins, and just putting those in your notes, and you draw this picture and you go to take the test and you have to remember how things are connected, you're gonna remember this picture. The very best way to learn and remember something is repeated exposure. Read, take notes, review your notes, make flashcards, Google it and find a video. Now you've seen or processed that information five times. You have a greater chance of remembering that information later. Now, should you do this with every single chapter, every single unit in every single class? No. This is for difficult information that may be harder to retain. And keep in mind that if you take 50 pages of notes and never look at them until a couple of days before a big test, you're going to be overwhelmed. So repeated exposure in different modalities is an important step throughout your process. So when I say that, if you have a test coming up and it's not coming up for, let's say, four weeks, you know that you're gonna have a test in four weeks, and you are taking notes a couple times a week leading up to that. Don't forget to schedule time in that schedule we talked about to look back at those notes and just start the process of that repeated exposure so that the week of the test, you don't have four weeks worth of stuff to try to remember. You've been remembering and reviewing all along. So here's an example of what my notes looked like when I was working on a research paper, not when I was studying for a test. This is a research paper type of notes. First of all, I always put my APA reference above the research so I remembered where the information came from and so I didn't accidentally plagiarize. Then I color coded each paragraph of my paper. So the yellow research is gonna go into my first paragraph, for example, and the pink highlighted information is gonna go into my second paragraph and so on. So I would copy and paste the research directly from the source into my notes, but then I would put it into my own words before I put it into my paper. That's just a little note on plagiarizing. And we're gonna talk more about this in another webinar I'm doing on critical thinking. So if this is something that's confusing to you, I'm gonna get way more into that. But this strategy of note taking made it really easy for me to quickly identify what notes I had for which paragraphs. In this example, I could instantly tell that my blue paragraph, paragraph four, needs more research. So then I'd go back and start to find more articles for that. And then I'd be ready to write. Another little tip here, sometimes I found that certain paragraphs were just a lot easier to research and write than others. So if I found that I was hitting a wall or I was getting discouraged, 
Rather than wasting time, I would just start writing the paragraphs that made the most sense to me, the easier ones. And surprisingly, once I'd get to writing, sometimes the information that I thought went into one paragraph would actually fit better into another, and I would get this momentum and a little confidence, and before I knew it, my paper would be done. So don't always feel like when you're writing a research paper, you have to go in order and you have to start with the first paragraph and you have to find all the research for that first paragraph. Sometimes you just need to go with what makes the most sense to you. Talking through a concept is probably the best way to commit it to your memory, even if you don't fully understand it at first. So you probably have heard of the phrase, fake it till you make it. And that's what I think of when I think of this. Talking through it, even if it seems confusing and you don't quite get it, will help you to process it and learn it. So when I was a student, and even now, I like to walk away from something I'm working on or studying and just ponder it for a while. Sometimes I'll take my dogs for a walk and I'll just think about it. And sometimes when I was writing a really big paper, I would just go for a long hike in the middle and I'd maybe find a podcast on that subject that I could listen to just to hear more perspectives and think through it some more. So when you're alone, go over what you know, like maybe even talk to yourself while you're driving. Sometimes when something is hard, you need to clear your mind completely. You don't need to think about it at all. So turn on some music and go for a run to clear your mind. And when you come back, your brain will be refreshed and you will have a new perspective. This is an important part of the writing process too. It's always good to walk away, think about something else and come back to it. I think what a lot of students do is they think that they have to sit and do something for a certain amount of time, no matter how many walls they're hitting, they're getting distracted, want to look at their phone, want to call someone, and they're like, I can't do that. I have to study. I have to study. I can't walk away from it. And the fact is, if you're hitting a wall and you're feeling like that, maybe the best thing to do is walk away from it and come back. Reorganize your schedule. So, you know, today wasn't a good day for me. I couldn't think. I was too tired or whatever. Today wasn't my day, and that's okay. I said before that there's a video for just about every topic in the world on YouTube, and if you're struggling to understand something, look for a different explanation. One of the biggest mistakes students make too is thinking that just reading something is enough. Reviewing your notes is an important piece, but how do you know if you really know it, right? If you're just reading through your notes and you're like, hmm, that makes sense, I like it, those are good notes. How do you know if you really remember it? Well, you have to assess yourself. You have to give yourself a test. You can make flashcards, you can use apps, you can find online quizzes. Test yourself to see if you really know it. And this is where you can use your family members or you can join a study group. These kinds of things come in handy because then you can have someone that tests you. So wellness tips are a critical component to studying. I already told you sometimes you just need to walk away and go for a walk. Exercise actually increases your brain performance. So take breaks in your study time and go for a walk or consider going to the gym right before you have a long study session. Or for me, exercise was a reward for my studying. Whatever works for you, and I'm not telling you you have to be in the best shape of your life and train for a marathon right now, just know when your body needs to move. When your brain is tired, you might also consider a quick power nap. And if you are worried that you're gonna fall asleep for hours and you don't have hours, then hone in on that power napping skill. It's crucial for life in general. Research shows that power naps are actually more effective than long naps in helping you to feel revived and rested. So you know when you take a long nap and you wake up and you're groggy and grumpy? Well, power naps, you don't have that same feeling. So set an alarm for 20 or 30 minutes only and just rest, clear your mind. Also make sure that you're eating while you're studying and your eating should be healthy. You've heard all the statistics about, you know, energy drinks and soda and, you know, keep that in mind when you're studying. I would say try to eat healthy things, try to fuel your brain with good stuff. And lastly, one of the best things for your brain is music. And I don't mean music with lyrics because that actually is distracting. Classical music, piano music is known to stimulate your brain and can play in the background so your brain is not distracted by it. 
Before you take a test, start with a positive mindset. You believe that you will succeed and you envision yourself passing that test. But if you have taken tests before, maybe somewhat unsuccessfully, advocate for yourself. And this means ask your teacher or instructor what you need to know for the test and what you could do better in terms of studying. Share your strategies. Say, I've tried this and I've tried that and I'm just not doing that well on the test. Somehow there's always some surprise and I think, well, why didn't I study that? It's quite possible that your instructor is going to give you a good tip like this. All the information on the tests comes from the articles. And you would be like, oh my gosh, if I only pay more attention to the articles, I would do better. Or all of our essay questions are actually discussion questions from our class. Oh, I should pay more attention to the discussions. Or I post study guides on my resources page of the online classroom. Maybe you didn't even know there was a resources page in the online classroom. So now you learned the key to a better performance. All of the tips I shared with you require time. Studying effectively takes time. If you're a procrastinator, which I know probably a lot of you are, will you have the time to do all the things I was just saying? Will you really have time to review and reflect if you've put off studying until the night before a test? No, you won't. And you've also probably stressed yourself out in the process. Not to mention, if you don't feel prepared for a test and you feel that you're going to vomit, then you might be the victim of your own self-fulfilling prophecy. So let's go back and talk about all the things you need, all these study skills I just shared with you for your own success. Step one is finding a good space to study. Step two, don't multitask. Step, step three is to set a schedule and stick to it. But remember I told you, give yourself grace. You're gonna have days where your brain just isn't there. Step four, be an active learner, not a passive one, always thinking and taking notes and processing any time that you're sitting down to do some studying. Take effective notes, try different notes if the ones you started with aren't working. Review your notes often, but don't forget to assess yourself and explain it to someone. Sit down with your spouse or your friend and say, I'm learning this cool new thing in my biology class. I'm going to tell you about it. They may not want to hear it, but it doesn't matter. It's for you. And find other resources. Don't always just look at the things that your instructor provides for you. If those things aren't resonating, then find something else that makes more sense for you. And don't forget to rest and exercise. So before we get to questions, I'm really excited to hear your questions, but I just want to let you know that my next webinar is next week. It's the same time. And this one's about stress management. So obviously we're all under a lot of stress right now in this world, but how do you manage it as a student? How do you think about it? And how do you make bad stress good stress? We're gonna talk about all these things and more. And so now I'll send it back to Lauren for questions. Thanks, Amy. And I encourage uh, a lot of you to attend that stress management workshop. It helps you whether you're a student, a parent, a person, with your job. I'm just a working professional right now and it actually helped me with some strategies just for sitting down at my desk and getting to work each day. So I'm always telling Amy she should be my stress therapist. So I encourage you to attend that session if you have time or of course watch the recording. Um, so I want to encourage all of you guys to start putting your questions into the control panel that you have as you have them, because the next section of this session is going to be just a Q&A where I'm going to kind of ask Amy some questions and see how many we can get through. It is optional, of course, so if you're good with just the content that you received, we thank you for your participation today, uh, but we're very excited to address questions for anybody who wants to stay. Before we do that, I just want to encourage everybody to follow us on social media because we post all of these events there. So instead of having to hear from your school or your counselor or whoever got you this information in the first place, you will be able to see firsthand when we're hosting events like this, whether that's somebody that is going to give the information out to your students or you are a student. We have a lot of different kinds of events that we're doing all the time and we post it all on social media, including that YouTube URL that you see up there. We post every single recording of these sessions and other webinars to that page. 
This one will be there a few days from now. The other sessions we hosted for student success are already posted there if you missed them. So between getting a follow-up email tomorrow that will have the recording and the deck, you can also always go check out the YouTube channel for any of these sessions and share them if you have friends, uh, colleagues, students of yours that you want to uh, check out these sessions kind of on their own time. They are there for your use. So, okay, Amy, looks like we've had a flood of, of questions coming in. Uh -oh. So let's see, <laughs> let's see how many we can get through. We'll probably spend the next 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, but again, thank you for all of you who attended if you uh, don't have time to stay. So before we get into some of the questions, I just wanted to throw out a quick recommendation from my own perspective of um, classical music. Many of you are probably not classical music people necessarily, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, I have always been a big uh, film nerd. And so what I listen to is movie scores. So it helps sort of have this nostalgic music playing in the background, but it's not distracting and it's typically fun like listening to the Jurassic Park music. So if you're looking for some classical music, wonderful movie scores out there that have helped me to write many papers and reports throughout my uh, schooling and career. Okay, Amy. So uh, I think there was a lot of questions around notes. So can mm -hmm. one question is, can you give some examples of how to turn headings into questions? Do you have any examples that come to mind on how to do that? Oof. Um, well, one easy way to do is if the if the you know heading is um, like types of plants. Well, that sounds terribly boring. Types of plants. <laughs> what you could, how you would turn that into a question is what are the types of plants, and then you were just going to answer those with the with your notes below. So it's what are, what is, how, and why. These questions, this is, these are the kinds of questions you want to ask yourself. So you just add one of these, no, these little question words to the beginning of the, whatever the heading is. And then you just answer below. It's kind of so like that's, turning it into yeah. Jeopardy. Where You're you, turning it into Jeopardy. Yeah. 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 Hopefully and that is very most effective. of you know what Jeopardy is, but... <laughs> <laughs> the concept is you have to turn the answers into a question. So, mm -hmm. yep. Uh, okay. One question on my students have a multitude of family members in the house and they have a hard mm -hmm. time finding a space to study. Do you have any strategies on that? And I think there was a lot of questions on like how to avoid distractions mm -hmm. overall. So maybe you can tie those together. I wish there was a magic bullet for this, you know, but there, <laughs> there isn't. And I don't have small kids anymore, but I have two dogs that bark every time someone drives up or walks in front of our house, you know, and that's distracting. So I understand that it, there's just not like, oh, you can just do this click. And all of a sudden, all the distractions are off. I mean, obviously, we're just totally distracted by digital things like our phones and, and our emails. And I've already told you how to get rid of that, but how to, you know, be get rid of distractions that might just be family members walking around your house and living life or, you know, being loud. The best thing, the best strategy I have is to make sure you have a schedule and it's posted for everyone to see. And you ask your family, you sit down and say, please understand that there are times when I really have to focus and please respect that time and, and understand that when you see on this schedule, mom is studying today between the hours of 12 and three, that that, that has to be quiet time. Um, that's not by any means the easiest thing to do. And especially if you have smaller kids, kids who can't, you know, just, I have older kids who would just go play on their computers, but you know, maybe that doesn't, that doesn't work. So um, the best thing I can do is, is I can tell you is to ask your family to, to respect your time, to find whatever space you can, even if it's a small closet, I don't know, you know, the smallest room, or maybe even your, you go into your kid's room and your kids are in, a, you know, a, a, diff, a playroom or a different spot of the house, or they go into the backyard. I don't know what it is because I don't know where you live, but um, that's, really all I can say. The eliminating distractions also, I mean, put headphones on, 
noise canceling headphones help. I invested in those when I became a student because I knew I would hear um, my family going into the kitchen and I would think what mess are they making and I just knew myself that I, I heard my kids in and out of the kitchen and they were little at the time that I would be worried about what they were doing so I got no noise canceling headphones so I wouldn't hear that uh, and then I also just we had an agreement these are the hours that I study the other thing that worked for me was studying early early in the morning before everybody else was up and I know that so many people hate that idea but it is it worked for me so just another suggestion a lot of parents do it at night when their kids go to bed but I also get that that's you could be completely exhausted at that time and that may not be the most effective but these are some ideas I think this is where the music can also help too right first yeah. of all put that phone away because text messages social media posts all that stuff coming in I know you talked about this Amy but that's mm -hmm. like the number one source of distraction, right? I just got to chime on my phone as we're in this meeting. So I should have left Me it too. in the other room. <laughs> yeah. So uh, put your phone away, put your technology away, shut off your notifications is like a really good starting point. But music is that white noise, at least for me. Yes. And it's really helped me to sort of, even if I'm in a room with other people, to be able to sort of block them out. So noise canceling or music, sort of whatever That's you good. find helps. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe turn towards the wall and not towards, you know, if you're at the kitchen table, don't look yep. at a, whatever is happening in the room if you have to share a space. That's right. Okay, let's see what else we got. How do I study when I have multiple chapters to read for different classes? So I think that's mm -hmm. a really mm -hmm. interesting question because we do have to balance, like I have to do my math and then I have to move to history and mm -hmm. then I have to write my English paper. So do you have any strategies for balancing that kind of workload where you have to jump from chapter to chapter on different mm -hmm. classes, different topics? I wouldn't do them at the same time if possible. So if you had, you know, something that requires reading um, like a, a textbook of some sort and it's going to require one part of your brain, right, then I would focus on that in that study time and then take a break before I would go on to a different subject. Because like we talked about that 14 minutes it takes for your brain to refocus, well, you're gonna need at least that to go from one subject to another. So again, that's also the scheduling piece is scheduling yourself. Okay, I know I have to read for three different classes. So um, I'm gonna read on these days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm gonna do my readings. And then Thursday, I'm gonna do this assignment. And then Friday, I'm gonna do this assignment. So you're breaking it up. Um, and and I think that is probably the best way to do it. If you, if you need to spend a whole lot of time on a Saturday, let's say you just don't have time to learn during the week and you have to do it on the weekend or whatever it might be, Give yourself a break in between. So again, you can kind of refocus, set your brain to something else and then start back up again. I would suggest that. I would also suggest that you make your schedule based on what's going on with the rest of your family and your life. So if, if you know that reading is a really heavy brain, you need to, you need quiet, then don't schedule that on the day when you know your, your daughter is doing piano lessons in the other room, right? Or something like that. Or maybe piano, if she's good, maybe it would be helpful. Uh, but if, you know, you, you're constantly hearing mistakes and you can hear the teacher talking, the instructor talking to her, you don't want to be reading during that time. Maybe that time you're doing something different. So I, I also think it's really important to, to be careful of, what, what times you're doing what activities, knowing when you need quiet, when you can do it with, you know, a little more noise in the background, when you need to be sitting in a certain space and when that space may not be available to you. So I, one other thing, I think it was the one, uh, the time management webinar I did, I talked about how I took my kids to swim lessons twice a week. And during that time, I would spend reading articles and taking notes because for me that didn't require as much brain power and focusing as writing did. So my writing stuff I never tried to do during that time, but reading or searching for articles, reading through articles, taking notes, like I showed you those color coded notes, I did that kind of thing at that time. So that's also helpful. Amy, I'm thinking about this as you, you're answering and I'm thinking about how different subjects are harder that, for folks than yeah. others, right? Like yeah. I was an English major and as already disclosed, a film nerd. So anything like that, that was no problem for me to start right. taking on. 
I enjoyed doing it, whereas my math or my science homework, that was tough, right? That was a drag at times. So do you have a recommendation for if you should start with the, the good stuff, the easy stuff first, just to kind of make some headway, or should yeah. you start with the hard stuff first? I recommend starting with the easy stuff first because you will get momentum and confidence and you're, you'll see some progress and you'll feel good about moving on. If you start with the hard stuff first and you're getting frustrated, then the easy stuff even becomes harder. You know, it just, you're, you're, the way that you see your perspective on the schoolwork will change. So it's, to me, it's best to put the hard stuff off till, till later, get some momentum, do the easy stuff first. However, I will say that some people that may not work for you. Some people may just say, well, I mean, like my first day of the week is the day when I have the, I'm the most productive. So I feel like I get the hard stuff done first on that day. And that's, that's fine for you. But if you know yourself enough to say, sometimes I get into stuff and I get discouraged, well then start with what makes the most sense to you, get some confidence and then move forward. Okay, um, next question is, I seem to get very nervous right before a test and days <laughs> before stressing over the outcome. Very relevant mm -hmm. for you to attend next week's session on stress management and how to cope <laughs> with all those things. but. Mm -hmm. For those who are here, what can I do to calm myself? Well, that's really good. So again, you know, it's it's positive mindset, it's thinking about yourself, finishing, seeing yourself, completing that test, passing that test, walking out of there. What's your reward afterwards? Are you gonna go get yourself a coffee and say, good job? What are you gonna do when you're done? All of that is good. Um, also, you know, the more the more prepared you are for a test, the less nervous you're gonna feel. So if you are doing those study strategies I just talked about and you're studying weeks ahead and you're taking little bits of time throughout and you're studying and you're reviewing and you're you're testing yourself and you're seeing progress, like I just, you know, someone just tested me on all my biology terms and I rocked it, you're gonna feel more confident when you walk into that test. That's not to say you're not gonna get sweaty palms and get nervous and your heart race when you sit down. That's test anxiety and a lot of us have it. So there's no way to just absolutely make that go away. But being prepared is, is a big helpful thing. I also, you know, breathing exercises, take deep breaths, do some stretching before. If you're walking into a room and you have to do, you know, maybe you don't want to be doing your yoga in the hallway. But if you're at home and you're about to sit down and take a test, you know, maybe you're doing some yoga stretches, deep breaths, listening to some calming music, kind of put yourself in the right frame of mind and then sit down and start. Yeah, definitely. Um, how do you approach study skills for middle school students in an appealing way? <laughs> you immediately are thinking about your sons, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we can tell our kids all we want that this is this is the way to do something. And like I told you, I, I have a, a college age son who still thinks he does best when he's under pressure uh, because the, he's a procrastinator, clearly. Um, and I am his mom and I've told him a million times, hey, don't procrastinate. Let's do this. Let's try this. And he doesn't listen. So I can't say to you that that as a parent, you're going to be able to just suddenly have this, you know, boom, I can teach my kids that studying is important. Uh, but a really good thing to do when you're working with your with your kids is after the, the test is over or the stressful time is over, they've completed something, maybe they don't feel good about it, they've turned in a, a paper, they didn't do so well on it, whatever it might be af after the fact is a really good time to sit down and have that conversation. How did it go? What what did you think you did well? What What didn't you do well? What can I do to help you? Was there anything that I could have done to help you be more successful? I saw you got really stressed out about that paper and you were working on it at 11.59 and it was due at 12 midnight. I saw that happening. Is there anything I could have done to help? And actually just let them reflect. That's probably the best way to get your kids to look back on what they did and reflect and try to make some, some new strategies, set a new, a new um, path for the next go round. To me, that is probably the only way is if they come to that conclusion on their own to get them 
to do it. And then again, as I said last week, always setting a good example. If you're a student and you're showing your kids that this is how I do it and I'm doing it, you know, I'm, I'm sitting and, and working quietly and spending a lot of time and when I say I'm gonna study, I study, and you're setting that good example, you know, it may not seem like that's making a difference, but I promise you that it is. I promise you that that will pay off. Okay, awesome. Final question, and then uh, we're going to have to call it a day for the questions and wrap up the session. But uh, one question, it's pretty specific, but I think given the situation, we can broaden uh, the question beyond just the specific use case. But basically, in this question, the student has a full-time job and a part-time job and is taking a full credit load. And now that the world is different and... Mm -hmm. Uh, the person's taking classes fully online, it's proving more challenging. Like the classes online in this manner is not maybe the most ideal for the student given everything going on. I think a lot of us had plans this year for our lives <laughs> that are now yep. hijacked, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so anything you would recommend? Well, I mean, certainly in that particular case, talk to your advisor on, on campus if you have one and maybe think about if this mm -hmm. is the right academic plan for you in this situation. But more broadly, Amy, any strategies on how people can maybe adapt what they thought they should be doing this term? That's a good one. That's a tough one because we really don't know when things are gonna go back to any kind of normal, if there is a, a normal anymore, there's a new normal, right? So, I mean, as much as I could say, oh, I hope that, you know, you could talk to your advisor, maybe move some things around and plan for, you know, next semester looking a little different or whatever. I can't, I don't know that that's the way it's going to be. You know, I, I can't say that. And so adjusting is hard, but necessary. And uh, I do think like it sounds like you might have um, too much going on and it might be really, really a tough semester, I would definitely say uh, give yourself breaks. And I don't mean breaks like a couple of hours, but I mean, if you can take days off of work and rest, that's really important. Um, when I was writing my dissertation, I took off at least one day a month just to, to write. So I wasn't getting any rest, but I had to um, take days off like that. So I suggest you use your days when you can. I mean, I, what we tend to do in this society is save our days up because we think we're going to, I don't know, magically go on like a four week vacation. But <laughs> the best thing to do is to use them. At this point, when you're a student, use your days. I'm telling everyone that take days off to do schoolwork or if you can to do nothing, to do something fun and just give yourself a break. And I mean something fun that is like, around your house because you probably can't go that many places. So um, I, I suggest that. I, I do completely agree with you, Lauren. Talk to your advisor if you feel like it's too much. Give yourself a break. Know that that you are asking a lot of yourself. And it's okay to say, this semester I'm going to take you know one less class or one less really hard class. It's okay to do that, but I know we're already in the semester, so maybe it's too late for that. But um, and then also, you know, give yourself a light at the end of the tunnel. See that light at the end of the tunnel, you know, be very scheduled, cross things off, have dates written down. Know when things are done, like and, and look towards that date. It's really important. Like, OK, by, you know, Thanksgiving, I'm going to have all my papers finished in all of my classes. I can get there. I just have to get to Thanksgiving, you know, and just kind of give yourself little little bites like I'm going to get closer and closer to the end. That will help, too. I think my tip on this, and this is, again, beyond being a student, but asking for help can be hard yes. for some people. All mm -hmm. of you showed up to the session today, so you're already, you've are already you already taken the step of wanting to get some extra help. Obviously, at Tutor.com, we have thousands of tutors here to help people think, break down problems, break down stress. That's what we do day in and day out. I think it can be a little intimidating or scary to ask for help, but your institutions, whether it's a school and you have school counselors, guidance counselors, teachers, your university, um, even your employers, they have all been doing a lot of thinking about this and trying to build support systems for you. So lean on those support services that are out there, whether it's tutoring, you need help with academic problems and your institution, library, company, 
uh, provides tutor.com, use it. It's there for you, right? But yeah. there's also counselors and professionals and advisors out there at these institutions that are here to help you and think through these different challenges, especially in this timing. So I would just A lot of schools everybody. have student oh, success advisors as well, Lauren. So mm -hmm. if you have a student success advisor, this is what they do is talk exactly. you through these tough times. Yeah. So it might be intimidating or scary or almost embarrassing for some people to ask for help and ask questions, but these people, this is what they do. This is what Amy and I do, right? We're mm -hmm. here to help. So lean on the help resources that are out there. Don't be shy about it because everybody wants to make sure that you're successful. So That's that would good. be my final, final word for the day. That was great, uh, Lauren. So we're going to wrap up and again, thank you everyone for attending. We hope everybody has a good weekend. Feel free to check out social media for any upcoming events and look for our follow-up email tomorrow. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. Bye. Bye.